You've heard the word the creator economy and you're curious about it both from a brand perspective or as an individual trying to make content. You're going to want to stick around for this video with my friend Alex Antolino, who's my guest today. He's going to be talking about the creator economy and how brands can think like creators and creators can think like brands and the intersection of the two. We've got some super awesome resources for you so that you can download them. Description and link below. Let's get right into it. Hey, Chris, thanks so much for having me. And hey, everyone watching, I'm super excited to be talking about how to brand like a creator and how creators are building brands and how creators are engaging with their audiences and what can we learn as a brand and what can we implement to make our brands more engaging. And so I believe these youngsters are changing advertisement for good. And this is a super exciting conversation for me because only learning what these people have been doing for the last year or two years and implementing this to the way that I build brands, I was able to get seven times engagement rate for certain ads and three times the click-through rate. And here's what's best at zero times production cost. It's pretty great numbers, honestly. When I saw this, I'm like, there's something in this, I need to put more time and more focus on it. And that's why today I'm presenting as a creative director turned creator. So if you ask me, what do you do? That's what I would tell to you. Now, a little bit backstory about who I am. I started my career on film and advertisement. So I studied like academic filmmaking and all of that. Had my own studio that was like 10 years ago. And I worked for a lot of like fashion brands and stuff like that. A lot of like B2C brands. And so at some point, super accidentally and randomly, because I had no idea what tech was, I ended up working at Typeform. And so I joined Typeform about Mm, seven years ago or something like that. And the company was like 30 people, Chris. And the company now is about 500 people. I stopped working with them a couple of years ago, but I have went through like this crazy growth of the company, especially in the first two, three years, it was insane. And so on this journey, I've learned so many things that I, then I've been talking like on different stages all over the world, talking about branding. So if you know anything about Typeform, Typeform is a very like a form builder. They released um, Video Ask, which is also another tool that we're going to talk about soon. And then I've been also collaborating with Hotjar and other companies like that. So my work has been on the tech space. Now, Typeform, if you know anything about Typeform, is this very beautiful form builder that it's all about the experience. It's very design driven. You, you, I think you, Chris, you're using it because probably it's like giving a good experience and so on. So it's a very design driven brand that's built around the idea of excellence. It's gonna build your reputation because it's well executed. Fast forward to like 2019, they launched a product called Video Ask, which was basically the same idea of like online forms, but applied to video. And I was offered the opportunity to like build a brand from scratch, which was really exciting for me. It was a very small um, group within Typeform. So at the time it was 300 employees, only eight people. One of the co-founders, David Okuniev, started this project. And he was like, do you want to do this from scratch? Like you did for Typeform? Like, yeah, okay, let's do it. So we started working and it was basically me doing like the whole branding uh, thing for this brand, right? So. I started applying the same things that I did for Typeform and the, the creative team that I built there on my own here for videos. What was very interesting is that very soon I realized that what I would, when I would start posting content, it, would, it didn't work. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, what's happening? I'm like, it's the same thing we were doing for Typeform. Why is it not working? The main difference was that people um, were showing themselves on camera for this thing. And when I was overproducing the content, people wouldn't like react to it because they felt intimidated. So I was like, hold on, like I need to change the approach. Otherwise, I'm just not going to connect with these people and they're not going to use the product. So I kind of like stepped down and started experimenting. So what I did is like on my phone, I started recording a couple of videos and we need to think this is back in 2020 before the pandemic, right before the pandemic. And like people are not used to that, but the TikTok is starting to become a thing. So I started experimenting and like the videos that I was just literally me on my living room recording for 30 minutes would get 10 times more views and engagement than the videos that I was doing um, that we put like a week of time on effort. And I'm like, oh my God, it's just like 
it's insane. So I was like, is this a video ask thing or can I replicate this with other brands? So I started working with this other company called Aulart, which is basically like masterclass.com, but for electronic music producers, super cool what they're doing. And it's kind of like my passion project. And that's the company that we achieved those numbers that I was talking about at the beginning. And I'll talk about this example later. I was obsessed with this and I started getting obsessed with the creator economy and learning from creators. And then it recently worked with Till Hub, um, defining their brand strategy. And what I do today is basically I help creators build brands and I help brands engage like creators. So this is exactly what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna talk about creators and how creators build brands and how creators are creating these very engaged audiences and changing advertisement. Then we're gonna look at like how this is changing branding. And then we're gonna talk about the principles that these people are using to do what they do basically, which to me looks like magic, but I've been analyzing this and I think there's a way in which we can replicate this. So let's take a look at it. Also, I have something for you and everyone watching. So if you want to follow this, there are some little like workbook that I've prepared some resources that because this is like going to be jam packed with like a lot of insights, I think it's going to be way useful if you like write them down some way. So you can do this on your notebook or you can use this little deck that I prepared. We're going to go through like an exercise later. So I think that's going to be great. And you can see there's going to be like a notion template to run your content. So you can check it out. It's probably going to be a link on the description down below. That's so, so cool that you put that together. So well, you could pause the video right now. You could download these resources and then get them open and continue along. Or you could just finish watching this video and then go back to them later if you want. Let's get started. On in a world where content can literally make you the president. In a world, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. In a world where content can make you a billionaire. Mm. I feel like we are all agree that attention is valuable. And so I don't know if you're familiar with this book, Chris, um, The Age of Surveilling Capitalism. It's an insane book. It's it kind of like changed. I was like working in tech. So to me, this book was like I had to read it. It talks about big tech, Google, Facebook's of the world and how they were like using data to kind of like change behavior and it's very interesting the race of facebook and all of that so i was going through this book and i was like yeah data is like the thing that's why all these companies are so valuable then after a while i was like well data is important but the reason why data is important is because it's used for something else it's used to get attention and I think attention is the new oil. There's a video by Alex Ormosi that talks about this, explains it way better than I do. But I think this is a key concept that when you look at the most powerful companies in the world today, it's just very obvious to me. The Amazons of the world are powerful because they use attention to change behavior. If you listen to what I'm saying, I have chances to change the way you think and act. If you don't listen to what I say, there's no chances. Attention can be used for many things, can be used to, you know, run a country, can be used also to entertain, and attention can be used to educate. Kudos to you, my friend. <laughs> That's yes. right. Let's go. That's Let's right. do it. But I'm like, Chris, like if this is so obvious and on our faces, like why isn't everybody doing it? Like, to me, it's, I don't get it. I'm like, why are we not doing content as we go to the gym every day? If we want to have like a healthy online persona, like why are we not doing content? And uh, I've been reading a lot on LinkedIn and stuff like that. And I've really, I've, I've realized there's a big problem. And this problem has to do with measurement and attribution. So you've probably seen this quote, what gets measured gets improved. Yep. I think the opposite applies. What doesn't get measured doesn't get improved. And this is why this guy is actually very happy because as we don't figure out how to measure organic content and all of these interactions, we keep spending money on beta ads, trying to get that access, trying to get that reach. But that doesn't mean that this organic content doesn't work, right? Because very recently, we've seen 
Amazon partnered with the NFL to bring this big match, football match on Prime Video for Black Friday next year. So they wanted to turn this into like this little tradition where like every year for Black Friday, there's this match. And like, guess what? That's going to happen on Prime Video and it's going to be for people who are subscribed to Amazon. So AKA qualified users or customers that on the biggest sales day of the year, they're going to be on the platform ready to spend and excited about the match. Pretty interesting move from Amazon, I think. Then on the other side, there's on the other side there's TikTok, which by the way um, are putting like facilities on the U.S. to start facilitating sales on the platform. That's something very recent that happened, and to me, all of this basically is just hinting that TikTok is trying to become Amazon, mm. and Amazon's trying to become TikTok, or in more general terms, content and commerce are getting together. Now, let's talk a little bit about advertisement. So this is how traditional advertisement works. So big company has a bag, gets a fancy agency to create like a very cool commercial that is dramatically expensive. And then they buy space on different channels to actually promote this. What it's happening over the last years, and we know it as maybe influencer marketing, I call it creator advertisement, is basically the company has the same bag now, instead of like giving it to like a big agency, it gets distributed gazillion times to a lot of creators, which each one of them have they, their channel. Now, this is very interesting to me because in the same way the budget gets distributed, the message and the point of view gets distributed too, which if you ask any marketer, and you, I've seen you said this like a, how, a thousand times on, on the future videos, the most successful marketing strategy is which one i don't know word of mouth <laughs> oh we're not <laughs> well you got me on the edge of my seat here <laughs> i'm gonna give you the answer for the next question yes. i don't like it's like you now yeah <laughs> all right so the most successful marketing strategy is word of mouth and what this looks to me is word of mouth at scale so mm. i think what's very interesting here is that TikTok has normalized word of mouth at scale. Why? Because for some reason we were at home during the pandemic, bored to hell, and we're like, let's grab my phone. This is the only thing that I have and start making videos, which feel very natural and very like homemade and like very from a friend. So as a brand, if you're tapping into that, you're basically getting access to that word of mouth at scale that we're talking about. This is what I call a decentralized audience. This is something that major players are jumping in. For example, Walmart launched very recently a creator program where now creators can start promoting Walmart in a platform for creators that they launched. Now, there's also this stat that is very interesting, which is YouTube passed all streaming platforms in watch time recently. Can we like appreciate this for a second? That yes. means your channel, Chris, can potentially get a lot more watch time than movies on Netflix. And that means that you can even make more money than movies on Netflix. Can't wait for that That's day, insane. Alex. insane. It is insane. I, <laughs> I mean, it. this day has had... You'd be surprised some of the Netflix movies, how actually profitable they are or not. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I think we're living in these days, Chris, and like you are a good testament on, on that. Like a lot of the things that I'm talking about here learn from you. So I think it's like incredible that we are in this opportunity. And a lot of people talk about this as the creator economy. And I wanted to give a shout here to Colin and Samir. They have like a very cool channel about this on YouTube. And I think it was them that said at some point, the creator economy is not the creator economy anymore. It's just the economy. Yeah. And I have to agree with that, right? Because how would, it, how would it be possible for you to like promote stuff in the way you can if it wasn't for like content creation? Now, there's something very exciting about this, which is that there's an open war now between shorts, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, the major platforms to try and fight for your, your attention because there's new this new format, the short form video vertical format that TikTok introduced a few years ago, that it's becoming the thing that everyone wants to watch now. And there's no 
clear category king. So maybe we'd say that TikTok is the one like dominant platform for that, but everyone wants to own that. And so there's, we're in this moment, which it never happened before when you can actually create a post, don't do anything at all and post it in all these three major platforms without touching a single thing. And it can potentially degree good in all of them. How like, that has never happened before. You would have to do a carousel and then the same idea repurposing to like some video and like then other captions and then like reform a, like a square format or vertical and whatnot and like all these things which were like so painful. But now you can actually do that. What's even more exciting, and I, I have to talk about this because people are like, oh my God, but it takes so much time to build an audience. Yes, it does. But I actually think that it takes much time to build an audience because you don't know how to do it. <laughs> Can you, Chris, what do you think about that? I'm, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about this. Is that true? Like, I generally believe that it's not that much about the time it takes to build the audience, but for the creators to figure out how to do it. If you had to build the future too, but now yep. it's a cooking channel, which I, by the way, I'd love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it would take you the same amount of time that it took you to build the future to what it is today? Or because you know the tactics and how to do it, it would take you less time. I see. I, I would like to think it would take me, uh, it would be much faster to do it the second, third, and the fourth time for sure. And we have proof of that because Matthew and Sina was our content director who's heavily involved with the creation of videos on our channel. And then he left like a couple of years ago. He started his own YouTube channel and it skyrocketed up. The time in which it took him to get to 100,000 subscribers was. Uh, in an orders of magnitude quicker than it took us as the future. A hundred percent. And I've been following that journey too. And it's, it's incredible. And it's like so inspiring. And I, I believe that like, it's all about like learning the craft. That's why it takes like Mr. Beast 10 years to do that. But if he would start a different channel that has no, his, that he doesn't show obviously his face. So he doesn't have this competitive, like IP advantage. I would think like he like he knows how to do it now. It'll take less time. So the reason why I say this is because a lot of people feel like, oh my God, it takes so much time to do this. But if you actually learn how to do it, it doesn't necessarily have to, to be like that. And in the case of like shorts and stuff like that, because there's this fight for attention, you could literally post with no followers a video and, and get a ton of traction. And I know this is like cliche and so on, but I'm like testament of that. Like I experienced this this week where like I posted a video on TikTok uh, and it went viral to like 1.1 million views in like two days. And I had 150 like followers on TikTok, like no thousands, just 150. And the reason why I share this is just to get people excited that you could literally start today because this was this week. So you could literally start today and like, keep doing it and like consistently keep working on it. And it just, it just, it's accessible. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So I encourage everyone to like, at least give it a go. Cause you know, what's cool is like these people are doing it. And when they promote, like they're getting all this attention for free, basically. On the meantime, you have like all these companies spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in paid advertisement, not getting close to the numbers of engagement and reach that these people have. And so this at the end is like building a brand. What's even more crazy, Chris, is that these people, when they're ready to launch their company or their like other brand or their products, now it's not just that they get attention for free, but now they're getting paid to market. And I think that's a really exciting time and it's probably not making this guy that happy anymore. Maybe that's why he's like going into the metaverse. I don't know. But my bottom line here is learn how to make content. 100%. That's what I've noticed about the advertisement and how things are like progressing and evolving on the online space. And I was like, okay, these people are building brands. Like, how is this different from traditional advertisement? And this is what I'd like to talk about for a second. So let's focus on how creators are shaping the way we build brands today. Now, if you've watched any future video, you will understand by this time that brands are built on purpose. Building a brand is all about sharing your purpose and finding people that think like you. Now, I learned this from the future and I also learned this from 
this other guy a few years ago that put this video that everyone's like seen a zillion times and made a book about it. And probably Simon Sinek, the best example of this is um, Apple and Steve Jobs, the way he built Apple. And, you know, this campaign is probably the best example for the crazy ones. Nothing about the product, everything about the belief system of the brand. Now, when I was preparing this session, um, I was like, wait a minute, like how would like the TikTok account from Steve Jobs would look like? I think that'd be very interesting to see like Steve Jobs doing TikTok. Would he do it or would he just like be on Twitter? Like I'd be in really interested to see that, right? So as I'm preparing this, I'm like, when did Steve Jobs die? Do you know this one? No, I, I didn't know. We are here, okay? 2022. I looked on Wikipedia because <laughs> that's what you do. And so Steve Jobs died in 2011. That's over 10 years ago. When I saw this, I had one of these like Spice Girls moments where like, I'm like, oh my God, that was like 20 years ago. I'm like so old. But yes, it's it's been like already more than 10 years and it's kind of crazy. Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, was 2009. That's like more than like, what, 12 years ago? I'm not a good at math. But anyways, the thing with this is that I'm thinking about how would Steve Jobs TikTok look like, but at the end of the day, I'm like, how would the, his Instagram look like? Because Facebook didn't acquire Instagram until 2012. That's how the icon looked like. So like where like everything changed so much since then that it's hard to get my head around this. And honestly, TikTok wasn't introduced until 2016 and didn't become a thing until we were all bored at home for some reason, like three years ago. So this whole idea of purpose-driven branding, which is the way in which I build brands today and for a few more years, I don't think that's changed, but I'm starting to also see a different way in which some of these creators build brands, which is not that much about the purpose, but about the relationship. And so I've been looking at these creator, I've been looking at these creator brands, and this is how I think they're building their brands. It's all about characters and stories. So instead of starting with why, they start with who. Instead of aspiration, they're built around relatability. I know you, I like you. Instead of excellence and being perfect, they're built around the idea of connection. Instead of centralized, and now I want you in my channel, they're building the, their brands in a decentralized way, collaborating with our creators and whatnot. And instead of one directional, they're making it interactive. So it's all about the conversation. We'll talk about this later. Now, there's one last thing that some people might not like, but it's not about design anymore. It's about video. Video is the way that you'll build the more engaged audience because we connect with people, not logos. And a lot of these creators are leveraging video to build these engaged audiences. This is what I call creator brands. And I don't think this is just available for creators. I think any brand out there, whether you do B2B, B2C, or you sell socks, or you sell Thai food, you can tap into this and get that engagement. And we're gonna see how. When I was looking at Mr. Beast and his burger brand, I'm like, how does he describe his brand? What's the purpose of Mr. Beast Burger? So. I did what like you would do, go to the about section of the page, and this is what I found. Mr. Beast and his friend, Mr. Beast and his best friend Chandler, Chris, and Carl hosted thousands of fans during a pop-up event for Mr. Beast Burger. There's no like we believe in. It's all about characters. Here's another one, Prime. This is what they say. It's what happens when rivals come together as brothers and business partners. It's not about we believe water, like drinks, or energy. No, it's all about stories, rivals, getting together. Super interesting. So I guess this is the million dollar question. How can we benefit from this? How, what can we learn and how can we implement this? And this is where we're going to jump to talk a little bit of like the principles. I've spent some time looking at these creators, trying to figure out what they do, talking with a few of them. And 
we'll see what are the principles that these creators apply and how we can actually look at some examples of uh, some brands that are actually implementing this with like great success. And now Chris, I had a lot of fun preparing this section that comes now. I called it the seven creator virtues. And here we go. I also on the workbook that I prepared that you can download, there's this page. We'll go now through like the seven virtues of the creators. And there's these white boxes where you can actually write some ideas on how you can actually implement that virtue to your brand as it is today without changing anything else. What would it look like for you if you were a little bit more this way? Right. So, let, so let's get started. The first one and the most obvious one is obviously authenticity. Every creator out there is perceived as authentic and that's why we like them because authenticity is something we trust very important for brands. Now, a good example of this is Ryan Trehan. He built his YouTube channel recently from like 6 million to like 100 million, like doubled in followers like crazy in like a month, just because he was like putting videos every day, kind of like blog, but gamified and just being like quirky and, you know, awkward. And that's what people liked about it. So went like crazy. Authenticity. The second one is relatability. Mr. Beast is the top creator on YouTube. He has all the money in the world, as we can see on his videos. Now, why do his videos look like this? Like he could literally hire every cinematographer from Netflix movies, you know, have this like studio set up, shoot the videos with the most expensive cameras. But, you know, his videos look a little bit like, like homemade. He said it a few times in like a couple of podcasts. He does this by design. He makes them look bad, quote unquote bad, but by design, because that's what people want to see because it, it makes them more relatable because you could see yourself in those videos. Yeah, it's because we don't trust things that are overproduced. We feel like we're being manipulated. We're, we're, we see something that feels like it's crafted and manufactured versus we're just peeking into something that's happening in real, in real life. I want to put some context into what you just said in case you're not tracking along. Alex used to work with some pretty premium brands. In, in the world of advertising and brand building from the last 10, 20 years, it's all, always been about the most pristine image, heavily retouched, like you hire the best cinematographers in the world, the art directors and the stylists, and you're, you're creating that perfect 30 second spot. And the reason why you do that is because the media buy was so expensive, you had to make sure that you got everyone's attention and you could stop them in the track. So it was a game of one upsmanship where everybody was trying to outdo the next person they would get this director and this director was even bigger than the last director. And they would say, instead of spending $500,000, spend $4 million and spend $20 million making a 30 second spot. But here's where I see something that's really interesting, Alex, is that there's a convergence of technologies that's happening right now. Right now, there's a high-end production. We would say like a Ridley Scott, Michael Bay production, super expensive to do. And then we have the average creator. Let's just say your mom and the technology that your mom has in her hand and in her pocket and her purse is starting to come really close to what these creators can do. So today, Mr. Beast's video reflect what the common person can do with a point and shoot video camera. Um, but that's going to be changing because our standards and the way that we see video and, and photos is also changing. So I think eventually they'll start to look very close to each other. What you're saying is actually very interesting because I've been thinking a lot about this and how advertisement has evolved. And I was looking at the very early advertisement, you know, posters and maybe TV ads. We're like, so when we look at them now, they're so corny because they're like so product oriented that is like even cringy. And I'm like, what this, what, when did this all change and I feel what happened in a way was that advertisement people look at what people wanted to watch which at that time was movies like people went like to the movies and, and like saw films and like were engaging with that so advertisement people starting to replicate that and so we got things like the Apple commercial which looked like a movie the um, 1984 commercial we've got things like these crazy Nike ads that look like movie and like that that's what I wanted to do when I was a kid actually I was impressed by that right I feel because the consumption is now changing it's our due diligence as brands and creative directors to look at what people want to consume and like we've seen before people want to consume YouTube 
it just makes sense to pick from what these people are doing to try to bring it into advertisement and the way we build brands. And this is an example that I like that, that blew my mind that I gave you numbers at the beginning. So when I was in LA, I, I was contacted by the founder of Aular, this masterclass company for music producers, and they were recording with Tepo, who is the music producer from Kanye West from the album Jesus like a few years ago, and they were recording masterclass with him. This is the trailer I want to show you from the ad that they did. I want to go into a few things that are really particular to my process. You learn how I produce, the techniques behind my tracks, and how to make your first steps in this industry. All right. That's pretty dope, in my opinion. These guys are super talented. This is a great ad, in my opinion. It's like super well done, nice design, excellent. When we were on the shooting, I was there. I was like, let me try something. Because I already had these ideas in my head. It's like, okay, let me try something. Hey guys, I have this masterclass. Please go check it out. So I gave him my phone. I was like, can you say this on camera? And so we recorded this other piece. Hey, this is Shay Pope, multi-Grammy winning music producer and one of the industry's best kept secrets. I just released my masterclass. Go check it out. One of these two pieces, Chris, seven times engagement and three times click-through rate. Guess which one it was. Well, you're presenting a case here, so I know what it's going to be. It's going to be the second video, the one that's shot with your iPhone. It's the one that shot with my iPhone that costs zero dollars because there's no editing, no color grading, no nothing. It's just made with the phone and straight to, to the ads as a test for, as an Instagram story for ads. So relatability is, is massive. What I want to say about this is I have a 20... Uh, no, I'm sorry. He's 19 years old. I have a 19 year old son who's telling me, dad, don't do any color correction in your images. Don't do any filters. I'm like, what? How come? It's just basic color correction, right? It's best practices. He goes, because young people don't like that. If you want a younger audience, don't put on anything. Just leave it raw and look, let it be whatever it is. It's like, ah, that doesn't sit well with me. But now that you're making this argument, maybe my boy's onto something. I think he is into something for sure. Because the more we start doing things on the content, the more we start feeling like we're trying to like too hard to say something. And when someone's trying too hard, you know, they have an agenda. And if you're seeing this on social, the agenda is most likely they're trying to sell you something, which is what you were talking about a minute ago. And I feel like that's why we need to retrain ourselves. It comes natural to them because that's what they know. Like they're, they, they, they're growing up with TikTok and stuff like that. So it's natural to them. And the overproduced thing is like this yeah. quirky, like old. I, that's how I think they, they look at it. It's like, why is this like so? You're trying too hard. Mm -hmm. So I think this is fascinating and we actually need to learn from them. Collaboration, it's a very obvious one. Every single podcast is built on this idea. Colin and Samir again, your future podcast it allows you to tap into someone else's audience and like brings them potentially to your audience too but there's something special about collaboration which is people like to see the people who they like in other contexts because it builds the character so this is an example from an experience i had so as i said i've been working with Tio Hub, helping them define their brand and so when i was in their offices in rotterdam doing a brand workshop and whatnot, I was like, we should like partner with the something together. So I recorded like a couple of like video blogs with my phone when I was there and we put them together on Instagram as partners. These two pieces got like for me, like 46,000 views, which is an insane number for me. Cause like all the other videos you can see, it's like 4,000, 2,000. And this like kind of like blew up in like what I'm used to. What's interesting is that even though they have like 200,000 followers on Instagram, which is normal then that we get this engagement, it, those are the pieces that also got them more engagement for what they're used to. So this one piece got 2000 likes, which is a lot even for them. And I think the reason is because now they're seeing a new layer that someone else is bringing to the brand. So I feel like that's why collaborations are so interesting. Interaction, you can have a conversation with your audience, you can bring them in. This is one of my favorite examples of this. The Chiki Boyos built their own whole thing on TikTok based on this very simple idea, just replying to comments with a video. So their audience will basically tell them, I want you to do that, they'll go and do it. Check this out. 
go to a drive thru with a shock collar on. <laughs> no. No. And a uh, small cheeseburger. Ah! Please. <laughs> Everything okay? <laughs> yeah, 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 everything's fine. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Thank you so much. This is too good. And it's even better. <laughs> I just can't, every time I watch this video, I'm like, it's too good. But it's even better because this is exactly what people are asking them to do. And it just, it's also a way to prove, it's also a, a way to make content that you know it's gonna land because you've been asked for it. Number five is spontaneity. So reaction videos, I don't know if you know this, but I was shocked when someone told me, reaction videos are the most popular videos on the whole YouTube. No wonder, no wonder why Mr. Beast has a whole React channel with over like 20 million followers now. And all he does is just watch videos and react. For some weird reason that I don't understand, human beings are very excited about watching other human beings react to things, which is like, well, how can we do this as a brand? And I found this very good example. This is a coffee shop in LA. I don't think they're anywhere else in the world. Just in LA, they have few venues. They have 6 million followers. Chris, when I was in Barcelona talking about the project, giving them references for content, I showed this to someone in Barcelona. They've, they've never been in LA. And they're like, oh yeah, La La Land. Yeah, I know them. I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, I follow them on TikTok. I'm like, how? why would you follow a coffee shop in LA that's a local business if you've never been in LA before? That's the power of content and they've leveraged that power using reactions. That's all they do on their Instagram account. They just get nice reactions. Are you from the USA? I am. Well, USA, beautiful human being. I love your glasses and your outfit. Oh, thank you. Hello. Yeah. Fantastic. Then one of the last ones is video. This one, I'm not gonna spend much time here. It's pretty obvious we've talked about this, but I'm just gonna say one thing. If one of the most popular newsletters in the world is actually promoting their work, which is literally just words with video on TikTok, <laughs> that to me is just a reason enough to consider making videos. I'm not gonna say anything more. And so the last virtue from creators, the last thing we can learn is obviously storytelling. And I have one last example for this that is probably one of my favorites that ticks every single box that we've seen, and it's this one. Poppy is a drink also in LA, and they were starting to sell in different like grocery stores and so on. And they made this video, she's the founder of the brand. She made this video overnight really quickly, I think it took her like an hour, collaborated with, collaborated with JT, who is something I recommend you follow on TikTok, um, who was giving them strategy for this. And they did this video, check it out. Hey guys, my name's Allison, and yes, I got a deal on the show Shark Tank, and it was for my product, Poppy. So I started the company because I was having a ton of health issues, and I didn't feel very good, and I started drinking apple cider vinegar every single day, and it made me feel incredible, but I hated the taste of straight vinegar. So I went to my kitchen, created Poppy, and then I believed in my product that... I quit my job, we went all in, we went on to Shark Tank, got a deal, and I found a way to make it taste incredible. So Poppy helps with boosting your immunity, glowing skin, gut health, as well as you know I believe in it so much that I went on the show nine months pregnant. So, cheers. I'm like, cheers to you, girl. I mean, come on. Like you literally took every single beauty of a creator and like put it in like a super simple video that you did overnight. No wonder why this video got, I don't know how many, like 49, I think I'm like over it. Let me show you 49 million views. And for everyone that's saying, wow. it's a lot, it's crazy. And for everyone that's saying, oh, but like TikTok, that's a lot of views, it doesn't convert. I'm like, no, it converts. They sold out in 24 hours after this video went viral. 
So it's so good because it's authentic, it's relatable. You know, it talks about her being pregnant. It's just like low production value. It's just so relatable and has good storytelling. I was like, oh, I had this problem. Then I solved it, overcame You know, like it, it's everything is there. I think it's so good. She's amazing. I, I, I love hearing about these kinds of stories. The question is, have you had Poppy? No, I haven't. But I don't drink the... Now yeah. I want to try it. <laughs> this is the thing. Like you should because they're in LA. So... What's interesting here is like you can reach a lot of people and I might not try pop because like I don't think I'm the target. I don't drink anything that's not water most of the time. But to be honest, like if I see if I go to Whole Foods or like any grocery store and I see this, I already have that. Con- I like I think about her. I'm like, oh, this is the brand. And maybe I don't drink this, but I'm like talking about it to my friend and maybe they buy it. So I think that's the power of content like that. Where like when we think, oh, every piece of content needs to convert like that's the old mindset like that's the whole problem with attribution we were talking before where like not every piece of content needs to bring you a customer it's the compounding effect it's the invisible comments conversations that will bring you more sales okay Chris. so we're reaching the end of like this you know first part with ideas we're reaching the end of the idea part and like the the things that i've been learning that i wanted to share but how lame would it be for me to come here and just dump all of this here to you and not give you what I think would be like an easy way to implement all of this. So I created this very like little section, like short section for implementation. So if you're running a brand and you wanna, you're like excited about this, you believe in this, you're like, oh my God, like, yeah, like that's what I've been thinking. How do I do it? Okay, let's talk about how do you do it. So implementation, I'm gonna say one big thing. This that you see on screen was my dream since I started doing film. It's actually very funny and not many people will believe this, but when I was in film school, this was my dream. While people were looking at Spielberg and like, you know, all these movie directors, I'm like, I want to make an ad. And people were like, oh my God, you're like, you're selling out, blah, blah, blah. It's like, why would you do advertisement? It's so lame. It's like, I'm like, if people are going to pay you so much money, to condense one powerful message in something that's gonna be seen everywhere, something that's gonna be seen on Times Square, on TV. I'm like, I wanna be that person. I wanna be the person that can actually put a message, package it to you, and that can influence people with their buying decisions. That to me is super powerful because I see a lot of things that I don't like, and that to me is impact, and that's a way to change things. So that was my dream. That's what I wanted to do. And everything I did in my career was trying to take me to this moment. Now, when I built my team at Typeform and when I had my own studio, everything that I told you before, I built it this way, in a traditional way, leaning to that moment. I built it to excelling campaigns, to be doing great campaigns, one of massive big commercials to be displayed everywhere. I built it for design and even for film skills. I built it for excellence, to be perfect, to be the best in class. And I built my teams to be one directional because there's no comments on TV. What's interesting here is that creator brands kind of like gave me like a massive slap in the face because with very less resources, they were doing achieving better results. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing branding advertisement, it's not to impress people, it's to sell potentially. So creator teams, how I like to think about them now, instead of for campaigns, they're built for volume. It's not about one massive big piece that's gonna be super expensive that I think it's gonna work. It's now about, okay, let me do a lot of things throw them to the wall, see what sticks. Now, they're not built for design, if we've talked, they're built for video. Video is the one, the language now, we all talk video. They're not built for excellence, they're built for optimization. And they're not built for one directional communication, they're built for interaction. If you agree with this, I believe doing this transition, it's way simpler than most people think. And what I like to do now, Chris, is to kind of like brainstorm a little bit on how if you have a brand or you're in charge of, you know, content or branding or marketing for a small company or maybe you're a founder or if you are in charge of like making a brand grow and you believe these things that we've been talking about here, 
What's the first step that you can do tomorrow to start transitioning your brand in that direction? Let's do it. I have this little sheet here that is also on the workbook. So you can do this at home as we talk. Um, you can also use a notebook. So basically what I want to do here is like, let's think this is a roadmap, okay? And let's imagine that we want to start with why, then understand what we wanted to do, then who is going to do it, and then how are we on actually going to make this happen? Okay, so why don't we just do it for me? I'll answer the questions as if you're helping me, and then we'll build around that, right? So you're saying, what's my clear metric? My clear metric is right now growing our audience size on YouTube in particular. And I want to grow our YouTube audience to 3 million. We're at 2.02. So we're a million away, essentially, from the next milestone. And this is very important to me. So growth, um, it could, like I can see you doing like all these short videos. So that makes a lot of sense to me. What if you're doing this together with us, think maybe for Chris's growth, so he wants to get to 3 million. What is the growth for you? Like what, what does growth mean? Maybe like it's starting to build an audience. Maybe it's just like starting to validate your ideas. Because one of the things that I really like is to use content as research. This is exactly why I actually started making content on video ask because I wanted to test things. And the best thing to test things is to put them out as content because you read the comments, you're like, oh my God, they're using other words or they are more interested in that and that's the best way to learn step number two is what do we want to do to learn what you want to do in terms of content strategy and what type of content you want to do i would strongly recommend that you learn from other creators So I'm, I'm really curious, Chris, which creator do you like and are, are you like looking at right now to learn? This is a tricky one. I watch a lot of YouTube uh, and sometimes I run into something uh, that I like, like Big Think. Have you heard of Big Think before? No. Okay, Big Think, they make these 10 minute videos and they interview notable authors and they share their insights and they teach something really quickly. It's like masterclass, less produced and, and more succinct. And it's also like, like TED Talk. So it's kind of like a person sitting on a white psych. They sit on a stool and they just tell you like, my name is X and here's the big idea. They just tell you the idea right away. Oh, I love this. So this might be also interesting for me to look at. Um, so there you go. So you have like, you can start making a little list on like, what are the creators that are interesting? So for me, for example, I want to really be good at storytelling and like take you know the whole like things that will talk about branding out of this room and like into the street so i'm looking a lot of like creators that i might not necessarily like follow for their content specifically because i'm not their target like the erags of the world or like mr beast but i actually really like the language they're using and so how can i implement mm -hmm. that so i think that's a really interesting thing to do now for who if you in this case, Chris, we're going to think about a company that ha doesn't have a YouTube channel yet, because that's the case for a lot of businesses that they don't have a like a strong social media following or they just want to get started and they don't know how to do it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know how to make content. So it's really hard for me to start. I would say something that you can do is just hire a creator to do it for you. So when you're hiring a creator, I'm going to say it's very important that you're not hiring for influence. So you don't want to reach out to like the influencers or creators with like 200,000 followers, like the million followers. When you're starting to make content, you want to look for people who have validated their skills, but they're willing to collaborate with you to experiment with you. Because also these people, they're building their own brands. They're going to be very expensive and it's probably going to be less engaging for your audience. So what I would say when you're getting started is like try to find a creator on your niche that validated their audience, that they are between like 10,000 followers or 50,000 followers, something like that in the platform you want to grow. This gives them the validation that they know how to make content that is interesting to people. And so you can partner with them. You don't need to hire them because you don't know if this is going to work. You can offer them a contract for like two or three months and see how that goes. Don't also give them just one piece because that's the, the other thing. We talked, it's about volume. So bring them in, collaborate with them, see how that goes and don't put too much pressure on it. Let them do their thing and then reevaluate after three months. 
a lot of creators are going to be very excited about this, especially at this size, because they want to collaborate with audiences. They're going to work their ass to like make it work. And I think it can be a very highly beneficial collaboration where both parts can learn a lot. So hire a creator. I think I prefer to call them creators because the reason why you're hiring them is not for the influence. Again, you're going to create content. Probably it's going to live in your brand. So you're hiring them to create the content for you. So instead of like, let's say hiring a designer, you hire a creator. I actually think this is one way where a lot of companies are going to mo go moving forward, where they're going to hire creators instead of, you know, designers or writers or something like that, because it's just a skill that's necessary. And if you actually want to move in this direction, there's a lot of ways in which you can grow your creative team and by default you will like what i've been doing for many years like hire a creator hire the writer hire, like start building this team and outsource film i start i'm starting to believe that there's a different way i'm not saying that in every case but in some cases i think there's an interesting way to do it the other way around where you can bring a creator that knows a little bit of everything and that will allow you to actually implement those things and then you can bring more people if the thing grows and then the last one is okay how do we do it and my last recommendation for this would be um, create a content system a content management system that allows you to track so you're not obsessed about every piece of content so create content And you can do this with Notion, you can do this with Asana, like any tool that you use, and it can be a database. If you don't know where to start, I have included a template that you can download on the resources. So like, it's easy for you to get started. And obviously you can modify that. I actually got inspired with Matthew. He had like these great templates on how he was doing like the YouTube videos. So my mine is a version of what he put out for free. So I want to pass it on like as my version too now. So like we keep like sharing all of that, but it actually like changed my life and like how to make content to learn from someone that's been doing it because I have no idea, right? So getting those tools and like those management systems in place can actually work really well, especially if you're collaborating with someone. So at Video Ask, I had one creator we were using this and it was just working really well so chris i want to ask you is there anything else that you would consider for brands that are trying to like be better at content because you've been doing this for like ages and you're killing it like a lot of the things that i've learned i know from you and the future so what would you recommend people to do in terms of like who to work with or how to get started okay i i want to second what you had said about when you're working with a creator give them some money don't make it too serious and let them do their thing. I find that from small brand collaborations to really big ones, they think they know how to tell the creator what to do and they get into this micromanagement thing. They want scripts, they want storyboards, and then you're killing the entire creative process. And I find that certain brands who allow me to do whatever it is that I want, they get the best from me. They just say, here, just do something. If it works, we'll, we'll do more with you and we'll just keep doing it. So just try whatever you want. We don't need to approve anything. Just don't say anything bad. And then we're good. And this is a lot of trust and trust goes two ways. You trust them to create something. They trust you to build a relationship with them. And it's a really nice thing. So when you find a creator, make sure you dig into their past a little bit to make sure their values are aligned so they don't do something crazy. So for example, if they, if you're worried about um, like bad language, you just watch their content. If they use a lot of bad language, that's probably not a good person that you want to partner up with because you don't want to utilize their their charisma their personality and then say well we're just we want to cut this part out we want to excise this part and that's a that's a horrible way to work so find somebody you like someone who you trust and let them play and you'll get a way better return on investment i love it and yeah i think you put it in a great way people need to be trusted in what they do because that's the reason why you're collaborating with them because they know how to do something that you do not and sometimes especially when we're talking about this type of advertisement a lot of it is on learning the things we've learned for so many years and they're doing it so just like let them do it and don't expect anything because you know these things take a little time for them like to test and experiment so I want to give you one last thing that I've seen as a pain point for many people, which is, okay, how do I get buy-in? 
Because if we have this problem with measurement, we have this attribution problem, like how am I going to show up, you know, next Monday and tell my boss, yeah, give me like $3,000 a month to like collaborate with a creator. Like that's a lot of money, right? So I want to give you a sentence that's worked well for me. And I'm also curious to see, well, Chris, what you think about it. So I know for a fact that every company out there that has an online presence is spending a lot of money in paid ads. Some companies spend thousands of dollars. Some companies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. So I would start there. And I have a little template here. So I would say, hey, Susanna, I've been thinking about organic content and looking at what these creators are doing. I know we're spending X amount of money a month. Would you be willing to experiment with 5% of that money or 10% of that money during just a little amount of time, two or three months with a creator and see how that goes to see if we get some results that we can consider. And so I have here for you a template and you just need to fill the gaps. It's very simple. And I've used this before and it has worked every single time. And I'm going to tell you why. So, hey, Chris, yes. would you be willing to experiment with 10% of that budget? Which honestly, if it's $10,000 a month that it's, that they are spending on ads, which is not a crazy amount for a lot of companies, that's like $1,000 a month that you have to experiment. And test working with a creator for, let's say, three months. The reason why this sentence is so powerful is because would you be willing to put them in a situation where it's really hard for them to say no? <laughs> I learned working with Typeform and with the science communication professor that the word willing is a magical word because no one will say no to be willing to do something, especially if it's experimenting. Because now if they say no, they're like not innovators and whatnot. Like 10% also is not a big amount or 5% is not a big amount because you're comparing to what they're already spending. And if you give them the numbers, this is something that can actually change things. Now those two, three months, you can have to work a lot <laughs> and try to get some numbers, but you have like that runway, which you're not now trying to like make one piece work or two pieces work. Like you have a relationship with the creator that will allow them to try and do something special. So Chris, what do you think? I like it. I like that you created a little formula so that you can ask the powers that be to try to do something with a creator and hopefully help the company innovate and break away from those traditional mo models of, of advertising. Exactly. That's what I think we all should be trying to like move forward and try to give the message that we want to put out because we think it's important because we think it's impactful, but package in a way that people actually want to consume it. <laughs> So I just gave you even the sentence that you need to go tomorrow to, you know, your business, your team and start trying some of these things. If you believe at least 10% of this to be true, I would say there's no reason to not try it. And honestly, the only way to make content is just do it. It's just getting started and do it because you don't, you have zero control about the algorithm. You have zero control about the post getting viral. You have, there's no way you can control that. So I wouldn't worry about that. But the one thing you can control is actually getting started and starting like showing up a certain amount of time every week. So I'm going to say, if you've never done this before, your first metrics, they should be based on execution and time spent making content, not even the output, just allocate a time a week two hours, one day, one hour, whatever you want. Do this for a month. First metric, execution. The second metric, when you know that you can do this and you've been working this like thing for like a month or two, now you move on to output. And now you're like, okay, I can get this out. I know I can commit to like a day a week, one hour a week. Let me see if I can put one piece out a week. And then when you're putting this content regularly, Maybe it's like one month, maybe it's one week. I don't think it's one week, but like maybe it's like three weeks down the line or three months. You're like, okay, now let's look at the numbers because you have some data that you can look at and you, you've learned something. You can actually start looking at numbers. But if you've never done this before, you want to start, the first thing is like allocate some time and use some of these ideas and like experiment with it because content is all about experimentation. Great. Let me ask you a question because you said something that is kind of 
a, a little bit, I don't know, inflammatory. When you say attention is the new oil, make a case for that. Tell me why attention is the new oil. Right. So I think it's very simple. I think that we all live in these bubbles where we, we believe a reality that is based on our perception. And thanks to social media, we create our own reality. So your reality creates is very different from my reality. Now, what's interesting is that before we would create these realities based on TV or the newspaper I read and all of that, but now we all build these realities based on social media. So we get the illusion that we live in the same space, but the algorithm is actually manufacturing a reality based on your, your interests, your needs, and whatever who you are, and your demographics, and all they know about you. I think attention is the most important thing because it's the only way to build businesses these days. It's the only way to get your message out. What's changed, and the reason why before that was different, is because there were gatekeepers. Like you cannot have a movie on Netflix unless someone buys it. You cannot have a show on TV unless you, you make it happen through their studio, through their production company. Now this is changed. Literally you can set up a TikTok, YouTube, Instagram account and start talking to people and reaching to people. That's what's changed. That's what's actually changed the whole industry, the whole world actually. So now it's all about who you reach and what's happening with attention is that because it's limited, the prices are going up. This is what I realized working on video ask. The prices would go up and we would reach less people. So it's less effective to buy this attention and it's, and it's more expensive. So that's why I think like if to me, advertisement is an expense, it's a business expense. Content creation and brand building is an investment because it's something that accumulates over time and that will bring you traffic, attention, reputation, a lot of great things. Then advertisement will just give you ROI. So that's why I think attention is so important these days because it's, it's getting more and more precious. So those who know how to get that attention and turn it into something good, I feel like they're, they have a really good advantage point. Do you have any examples where people who have been able to grow, capture and leverage attention have done really well for themselves? Why is this the essential thing to be able to do? Because that's a big statement to say attention is the new oil because oil runs the world or used to. Maybe that's changing. Yeah, I do have a good example. Like it's in front of our faces. Mr. Beast literally went from saying like 12 our straight PewDiePie, 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 to actually, you know, becoming like a millionaire with just leveraging attention. Like a lot of people is like, oh, Mr. B is like a great storyteller. I don't know about that. I like to talk with Mr. B about storytelling. What I know he's great at is capturing and managing attention. And he's, he's been able to build this massive empire and he's, continue, he's gonna continue to do that. Um, through, through, through doing that, through getting attention and managing it and like, you know, sending it to different places. So I think it's a great example. And I think it's also a very interesting one because Mr. Beast, like him or not, it has a, this message of like giving away, right? That's what made him grow so much. Um, you know, this idea of like sharing with other people, I don't care about the money I have, I'm gonna give it away. So whether you like Mr. Beast or not, you have to, um... You have to admire the, the man's hustle, his ability to capture uh, attention through creating hooks and, and videos that are almost guaranteed to be viral. And his whole business model is built on that because what he does is he practices some form of 21st century philanthropy. There's some questions about how philanthropic he is because he's giving money to his friends and it's kind of a strange thing, but it's working. And now during the pandemic, we were all... Um, isolated in our own homes and he was able to do something crazy. He was able to launch a national burger chain that was only available through his app and for a period of time became the number one most downloaded app on Apple's store. How did he do this? Let's rewind the tape a little bit here. 
So he said, we're going to open a burger stand and we're going to give burgers away for free. So there's this massive line that's like a mile and a half, two miles long. It creates all kinds of problems with highway patrol, whatever. And you pull up and not only do you get the burgers and the drinks are free, every once in a while, he's like, here, take $10,000. Can you answer this question? Oh, even if you get it wrong, I'm going to give you money. You choose A or B. You need a new car? Here's the new car. And so it was this fantastic video. Very entertaining. Simultaneously, I knew there was a business play involved. I think he launched like over 100 Mr. Beast chains throughout America certain locations and he's building a massive business he was recently on a couple different shows and he said he was offered a billion dollars to buy all of his companies and he turned them down because he thinks he's worth more than that that is the power of attention who is basically a small town kid making videos and being super determined hyper relatable knows how to grab attention is able to build now a billion dollar company you would say prior to this moment in time that a YouTuber who dreams of making a billion dollars being worth that much is a crazy far-fetched idea. Not so far-fetched anymore. I'll share one more story with you. Not that she needs more attention or more money, but Reese Witherspoon, the actress, has a production company and she has a massive following. I, 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 I suspect the reason why she has a massive following is because she's a beautiful woman, but she's not so beautiful that she's intimidating. She's kind of like the girl next door and seemingly very grounded and down to earth, right? And so she has a book club and the book club has two and a half million members in the book club. And when she recommends a book, quite a few of them buy the book. So that's a lot of power. That's a lot of power to be the king or queen maker. So for an author to be considered uh, for the book club, they have to grant her the TV and the movie rights to their book. Now, from the author's point of view, being able to have two and a half million people potentially buy your book, that will make your life. That'll change your life. Even if you get a dollar book, that, that makes you a millionaire overnight. So of course they agree. And so she recommends the book if it's good. They read it. And depending on how excited her audience or community, the attention she's been able to garner, she then options to create the TV show or the movie. And her company, Hello Sunshine, her production company was sold for almost $1 billion, $900 million dollars. This is incredible. So if you're still on the fence thinking about does attention matter? Yes, it does. Maybe it's debatable whether or not it's the new oil or not, but it's hard to deny people like Conor McGregor with Proper 12 Irish Irish whiskey, uh, Dwayne Johnson's tequila, um, uh, the Jenners, the Kardashians and what they've been able to do with their product launches and selling out in minutes. It's incredible. Attention. It is the new oil. A hundred percent. And I think her company is fantastic. And the one thing that I've heard recently on a podcast, and I don't remember who that was, so don't blame me for that. But someone said, look, it, what is harder to make a product and make it better over time or to build an audience? Probably building an audience is harder. So it just makes sense that those creators who know how to build audiences can launch their products or partner with um, other CEOs to launch their products like Feastables with Mr. Beast. And those companies that need to get attention that is progressively getting more expensive are struggling more now to build their, those audiences, especially if you're building that from scratch. So that's why it's so important to not only understand how attention can you know, make or break a business, but also how to it's a skill so how can we get that attention how to how can we manage that attention it's something we can learn and i think it's a great skill to have on your belt 